know that God can use whatever it is that we give him. Did you know that? Just a few weeks ago, we talked about a little boy that had a few loaves of bread and a couple fish, and he gave it to the Lord, and God used it and fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and then gave him back 12 basketfuls. I just read to you where um, this servant brought the first fruits, uh, and it was a few loaves, and this guy says, What is this among so many? And the prophet said, feed the people, and they'll eat and have food left over. And they fed the people, and they had food left over. I want you to know that when God is compelling you to do something, He can bless whatever it is He compels you to do. He can bless you physically with the strength to do that that He's called you to do. He can bless your automobile. He can bless your home. He can bless your finances. God can bless whatever we will dedicate to Him. I've never lost anything that I let go of for Him. He's always kept good safeguard over it. Today I want to talk with you about my house. And I say that my house... Is God's house. Now, I want to tell you this. Not just that. Everything I have is God's. My barn out back, my trailer, my dog. Are you with me? All of it's God's. Whatever he wants. My tools, my saw, everything I got, everything is God's. A little boy named Danny had lived with his family in a trailer. One day someone asked him, said, Don't you wish, Danny, that you had a real home? Danny's reply was wise beyond his years, and he said, We have a real home. We just don't have a house to put it in. I want you to understand there's more. To, I mean, you can have a home in a cardboard box. Amen? Brick and mortar don't make the, the home. That's much like the church. Did you know something? We have a beautiful facility, don't get me wrong. And people recognize that facility, but that is the building you and I are the ecclesia. That is the called out ones. We are the children of God. We are the church if we stand on the concrete and have no building. We are still the church. So whatever you give to God, and I want to challenge you now to say, God, my house is your house. Let me show you. In the New Testament, there was uh, a, a conversation between Jesus, and it went like this. He said, I want you to go into town, and there's going to be a post there, and there's going to be a colt tied to the post. I want you to go and get that colt and bring him to me. And they said, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What about if the owner? He says, well, if the owner says anything to you, just tell the owner that the master needs it. Amen? Now, we don't have much more explanation than that. He just simply said, the master needs the colt. And that colt would be the colt that Jesus would ride triumphantly into Jerusalem on his last ride. Are you with me? And it is a wonderful thing for, to hear the words, the master needs it. I think about the apostle Peter who made his living fishing, and Jesus come to him one day and says, can I borrow your boat? What, 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 what are you going to do? And what Jesus did was got into the bow of his boat and backed it off of shore just a little bit to give him a little separation and, lo and use the natural acoustics to address a crowd. But he says to Peter, do you mind if I use your boat? Whatever you need, Master. My boat's your boat. My coat is your coat. What about Joseph of Arimathea? You remember him? He's a great man. Jesus had been crucified, and Joseph of Arimathea came with Nicodemus, took him down. They begged the body from Pilate. They wrapped him, and they anointed him, and Joseph carried him to his own exquisite tomb and placed him in there. Some say, well, how would he? And others say, well, Joseph knew that he wasn't going to be there long. 
I don't know. But he simply says, my house, my tomb is yours. What about Martha? I preached on this on Wednesday night or taught Martha and Mary. Martha had a home and she invited the Lord to come into her home. Mary sat there and began to worship the Lord. Martha was cooking. I don't know what all it was, but she had perhaps lasagna going or turkey. I don't know. But she was just cumbered about many things and troubled and distracted and anxious to make sure, you know, maybe Cascade left a little spot on the glass. I don't know. But nonetheless, she's trying to make sure it's perfect. And finally, Martha goes in there to Jesus and says, Jesus, do you understand what she's done to me? She's left me to work in the kitchen all by myself. Sound like a bunch of church leaders. She's left me to work in the kitchen all by myself. And here was the take Wednesday night if you wasn't here. Uh, Jesus says, Martha, what you need is one thing. Not another dish, not a peach cobbler. He said, what you really need is to do what she's doing. She's done what really matters the most. You do need to serve, but not at the expense of worship. She was sitting at Jesus' feet, worshiping him. But to Martha's credit, she said, my house is your house. Amen? My house is... I think about Zacchaeus, and I don't have time to preach that. Jesus kind of invited himself to his house. But nonetheless, there was a change in his life. He gave away half of his goods to the poor. He restored anything he had stolen four times. And Jesus said, today, salvation has come to your house. So here's, here's what I need you to understand today. That, that God can use anything you give him. So if you decide to give God your house, and I'm not asking you to go sign the deed and all of that. Now, if the Lord moved you that way, you do it. But I'm not telling you that. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying, my house is your house. You've got to understand this because if not, if you don't get this, what I'm saying, you could miss out on the greatest blessings and the greatest divine visitation of your life. Amen? You say, well, pastor, you know, it all happens at the church. No, it don't. Some of the greatest ministry happens out there. This is a celebration right now. We sing and we're jubilant and I love all that. But I'm telling you, I meet more people in the streets than I do genuine ministry. I meet more people in the homes than we do genuine ministry. And that's what feeds this celebration. You know, you've got to realize this. I, I would hate for you to get to the end of life and look back and say, you know what? I could have given God my house. I could have given God my garage. I could have given Him a place of my business or whatever. I could have done something. You know, it could be a Cornelius moment. Cornelius invited Peter to his house. And um, when, when Peter came down there, he got into, I believe, the fifth paragraph of his message. And while he was preaching away in, in um, a Gentile's home, legally wasn't even supposed to be there, He's got a few of his Jewish buddies with him, and they know they ain't supposed to be there. And Cornelius is here, but God has worked on the Apostle Peter by showing him a vision. He's worked on Cornelius, and he sent men, and they got together, and they came down, and Cornelius says, you can preach at my house. He said, Pastor, what, what do you mean talking about preaching? At house? Listen, I'll tell you something. There'll be people that'll be willing to come to your house that'll never darken the door of this church. This is too churchy for me. He said, well, we ain't real churchy. Now, listen to me. There'll be people that'll sit around a barbecue in your backyard or your patio, and they'll study a word. They'll study a book where somebody points them to Jesus quicker than they'll come and darken these doors. And that is how we will win this generation. I'll guarantee you, did you realize only 40-some-odd percent of people will come to the church? I don't care what banner you say is out there. I don't care if Blake Shelton is in the house, saved or not. And I'm not speaking either way. I'm just, I'm just saying. So you've got to realize it could be a Cornelius moment. It could be a Jairus' moment. You remember Jairus? Jairus was a man whose daughter was 12 years old and she fell sick. Two of the writers of the gospel said she was very sick. One said she had already died. But let me give you the version that I'm reading here. He was on his way to Jairus' house. On the way... A woman with an issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. He healed her. And all of a sudden, one of his servants, or the servants of Jairus' house, met him in the street and said, Don't trouble the master anymore. No need to come on to his house because she just passed. She's dead. 
And Jesus says, Jairus, I'm coming to your house. She is not dead. She only sleeps. Huh? They said, no, they, they, they didn't get it. it got, there was a whole bunch of people in Jairus' house. And, and, you know, he's a ruler of the Galilean synagogue and all this stuff. There's a lot of hoopla and fanfare there. And Jesus says, I tell you that she's only sleeping. They said, you don't get it, she's dead. And Jesus put every one of them out. He walked into the room and said, Talitha kum. Means little girl arise. And she got up. <laughs> I felt it too. Are y'all hearing me? Get up! And she got up. Oh, it could be a moment like the moment at Jairus' house. If we simply say, God, my house is your house. You know what I did a couple a year ago now, really, the semester? I decided I felt led of the Lord to host in my house. Oh, Lord, I had to talk this over with Kelly after I committed to it. Are y'all with me? And uh, I said, we're going to host the teenagers, a life group for the middle school and the high school. I'm going to tell you something. We won two families to the church through that life group. <laughs> Amen. Why? Because children sit around a campfire. Young adults sit around a campfire. We laughed. We, we joked. We played. We discussed Christ the chatterbox. We talked about hardships in their life. We, we, we threw uh, um, whatever the game in his cornhole. We done all kind of stuff like that. We made s'mores. But we prayed. And God used my house. Are you with me? Say amen. It could be a healing experience. It, God could use your home as the launching pad for a brand new ministry. Let, let me say, so here, you say, well, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, I'm, miss, I'm missing out on something? Possibly. So what do you want me to do, Pastor? Okay, I want you to do this. I want you to say, God, my house is your house. God, my house is your house. Let, let me give you an illustration. I want to show you 2 Kings. Turn there with me, if you will. In 2 Kings chapter number 4, verse number 8, I want to read uh, just a little ways through there. <clears throat> we find a Shunammite woman. The Bible says, Now it happened on one day that Elisha went to Shunam, where he was a, there was a notable woman. Somebody say a notable woman. She persuaded him to eat some food. And then I want you to get this. The Bible said she persuaded him. In other words, it was almost as if Elijah was, or Elisha was just passing on through and she said, would you mind coming to eat? And he says, no, nah, I don't want trouble. He said, oh, please come. Let, let, let me and my husband fix a meal for you. She persuaded him to come in and eat. And uh, so, he, so he did. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. I got thinking, I used to go do some visiting, and I remember I'd come up on somebody's house, and I'll just use Lori Wright as an example, and she'd be cooking stuffed bell peppers or whatever, and me knowing Kelly's got something cooking at the house, and Lori say, well, Pastor, you have something to eat? I said, no, I'm all right. Oh, yeah, come on, try this. And so I, then I eat it, and I get in trouble because I get home, and Kelly says, you've already eaten, haven't you? Well, I ate with Rex and Lori. Well, why did I bother cooking all this? But anyway. Elisha stops in on a regular basis. So the Bible says, so she says to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Ladies, I'm going to tell you, you've got some influence with your husband. Are you here? Please, let us make a small upper room on the wall. Not, in other words, not let him have our living room. Let's build him a room. Are you all with me? Say Amen. Let us make him a small upper room on the wall and let's put in there a bed for him and a table and a chair and a lampstand so that it'll be whenever he comes this way, he can just turn in here. In other words, he don't have to pay a motel. He don't have to do this. We can just be kind to the man of God. Our house can be God's house. Y'all with me? Say amen. And it happened one day that he came in there. He turned into the upper room and there he lay down. And, but, but here I want you to get something. Something has happened. Um, I want you to get something. Right? I want you to catch this in my story that I'm telling you. God desires to reward those who make room for him. I want you to understand that. I'm going to say it again. God desires to reward those who make room for him. And the Bible says, Then... He said to Gehazi, this is what Elisha said to Gehazi, his servant. He said, call the Shunammite woman. And when he called her, she stood before him. 
And he said to him, now I don't know why Elisha wasn't talking to her directly. Obviously it wasn't just him, but Gehazi, his servant, was with him. Say to her, look, uh, you have been really concerned for us with all of this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She answered, no, I dwell among my own people. What can we do for you? In other words, Elisha is saying through Gehazi, what is it that you need? God is concerned. He don't want to just use you. He don't want to just use your car, your house, your finances, this, that, and the other. He says, what can I do in return? What can I bless you with? And so, what, what can be done for her? And Gehazi answered and said this. Well, actually, she has no son and her husband's old. So you take from that what you want. She has no son and her husband's old. In other words, things ain't working like they used to. Y'all with me? <laughs> so, he said, call her. And when he called her, she stood in the doorway, and then he said, about this time next year, you're going to embrace a son. I imagine a husband's eyes sort of popped open. Huh? What does this mean for me? Just a thought. <laughs> and she said, no, my Lord, man of God, don't lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the time had been appointed of which Elisha had told her. Here's what you see. Let me just say this. And I want to leave my story for a moment and come back to it. Almost like a soap opera. That'd be all right for a moment. Do you realize what could happen if everybody here said, like the Shunammite woman, My house, oh God, is your house. My house is your house. Listen, can I tell you what would happen if 10 to 15% of Sunday morning worship, that'd be about 35 houses or so, 35 homes or 40 that said, um, my house, your house, God. Lord, have mercy. You couldn't put them in here next year. You can't hardly do it now in one service. Are you with me? So can you see the effect that that would have. Now let me jump back to my story. I want you to know, anytime you open yourself up to be a blessing to God, in other words, you've opened your checkbook and said, I want to bless the church, the devil's going to fight that. He will. When you say, oh Lord, I I'm going to launch this ministry, the devil will fight that. When you say, I'm going to host a life group, the devil will fight that. But I want you to understand, God will always come through and it will be greater than what you ever anticipated. I'm going to show you. Well, trouble came. The Bible said in verse number 18, the child grew. And now it happened on a day when he went to his father, to the reaper. So he's on up a little bit. I don't know how old he is yet, and they don't really say. But he says to my father, my head, my head. Some scholars say it may have been a heat stroke. I don't know. Perhaps they were in South Georgia. But uh, he says to his servant, carry him to his mother. Y'all know how that is. Baby, get sick. Go to mama. You, you got to get him to mama. She knows what to do. So when he take him to her, he brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees till noon and then died. Wait a minute now. The man of God asked me about a son. What can I do for you since we built this room on? We put a table and a lampstand, a chair and a light and all that. And we've tried to be nice and all that. And I told the man of God, I didn't want him to lie to me. And I didn't want to be fooled and all that. And now look, my son has come. I've got my hopes up. He's big enough. He's helping my husband in the field. Now he's dead. No, she didn't say that. She didn't say that. The Bible says um, he died and she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. She took him in that room that she built for Elisha, and she laid him on the prophet's bed. Are y'all hearing me now? She shut the door upon him and went out. Then she called her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men, one of the donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and come back. He said, Why are you going to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. She says to him, It is well. Wow. I'll deal with that in a moment. She saddled a donkey and she said to the servant, Drive and go forward and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. You see, what she's saying is, I know I'm a lady. 
and we don't normally ride quite the way these men do. She said, but right now I want you to hit that donkey as hard as you can hit him, and I want to go to the man of God, and don't you slow down unless I tell you to slow down. So there they go. They take off. And uh, uh, so, so it was when the man of God saw her a long way off that she said to his servant Gehazi, he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? Notice the faith of this woman. You know, she answers. Here she says, It is well. Now, now get this. What did I tell you happened? He come home and sat on her lap till noon and died. She carries him up to the man of God's bed, lays him down, shuts the door, tells her husband, I got to go run an errand and I'll be back. Don't even tell him that the boy's dead. Wow. So when she comes, uh, she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone. For her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not revealed it to me or told me. And so she said, did I ask a son of my Lord, did I not say, do not deceive me? Here's what I want you to get. God always comes through. I don't care how bad it looks. What? Then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If anybody meets you, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, don't answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. Boy, there's a lot of preaching right there. Gehazi said, don't greet nobody. Y'all been riding down the road and seen somebody? Maybe Pastor Smike, and he, he's busy. He looked, that sorry rascal didn't even acknowledge that I was at the red light next to him. Trust me, if I saw you at the red light, I would wave. I would say something, but the Lord may have me on an errand. Just a thought. Just a thought. But nonetheless, if you meet anyone, don't greet him. If anyone greets you, don't answer him. But go and lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives and your soul lives, I'll not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them, and he laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he came back to meet them and told them the child is not awakened. Now there's, uh, there's a real kink in the situation. The man of God gave a prescription. Gehazi carried it out. He laid his staff on top of that child. He said nothing happened. There wasn't a sound. There wasn't no movement. Nobody got up, and he's still dead. Elisha says, I'm on my way. Are you all with me? Sometimes you've got to pray again. Sometimes you don't get it the first time. Uh, Paul said, I sought the Lord thrice, three times, about this thorn in my flesh, and I asked God to remove it, and he never did. He simply said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. No, I know we don't like that one. When Elisha came to the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. There's the child lying dead on the bed of the prophet. And uh, he went in, therefore, and he shut the door behind him, the two of them. He prayed to the Lord. He went up and lay on the child, put his mouth to the child's mouth, his eyes to his eyes, his hands to his hands. I know it's unorthodox, and y'all would be flipping out. And you know what? As a parent, I might be flipping out too, but if my child sneezed seven times and got up and walked out, lay down, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, whatever God's got to have you do, do it. We, Naaman had to dip in the Jordan River where sewage uh -huh, was floating by, and the Lord wanted to see if he was willing to go do it. He says, go dip in the, the river. Naaman says, isn't the Abana River and the Farfa River much cleaner waters? It doesn't make sense for me to dip in the nasty, dirty, uh, disease-infested Jordan. And God does unorthodox stuff. And he uses the foolishness of men to confound them. Wow. So let me move on. So, uh, Mouth to mouth, his eyes to his eyes, and, hands, and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house again. And he went up and stretched himself out upon him again. Then the child sneezed seven times and his eyes opened. And he called Gehazi and he says, call the Shunammite, Shunammite woman. So he called her, and when she came in, he picked her. He says, "Pick up your son." So she went in, fell at feet, bowed to the ground, picked up her son, and went out. Wow! So if you could just remember this, it is important to know that God can use 
my house. God can use my house. God's blessings can come down on my house. And I want to tell you one quick story and we're going to pray. And I'm going to call, I'm going to call you to a decision. And the decision that I'll call you to in just a moment is to say, can God use my house? Yes or no? Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll come and have a life group in your house, but what it does mean is you'll say my house is available and we'll put it in the mix and Brother Ken and his team and coaches will look at it and if it best meets the needs of the location and what we're trying to do, you say, hey, my living room is available. Uh, whatever it is is available. It, mine is God's. It, it's not mine. There was a fellow by the name. Now, I know you don't name your children. There's a lot of people name some, some funky names. But this guy's name was Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom was, it was, he had a farm. And when the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Lord, you remember the Ark of the Covenant? that had been taken out of, well, Hophni and Phinehas, the high priest's sons, took it out and went to battle with the Philistines and all that, and they lost it. Anyway, before it was back home to Jerusalem by David, the king, it stayed for three months at the house of Obed-Edom. I want you to know what happened. People got looking at Obed-Edom. In that three-month time, they said, My God. Look at Obed-Edom. His crops are flourishing like no crops in the land. His barns are busting like nobody's barns in the land. His children and offspring turned out to be like 62 sons. Not his only, but sons, grandsons, you know how it goes. I mean, and that was eventually. That wasn't right then, so... But, but what they said was, we look at the house of Obed-Edom and everything Obed-Edom touches is blessed. And somebody said, I know why. God is welcome there. And God blesses everything He puts His hands to. Everything His mule plows, God blesses. Everything He touches, God blesses. I'm going to tell you something. It took commitment, but did you know what? When Obed-Edom, after three months, King David come to the throne and he decides, or he might have already been at the throne, he decides it's time to move the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, back to the holy city, Jerusalem. You remember they tried it the first time and, and they stumbled and, and um, the guy was killed because of it. And then the Ark you know, stayed at Obed-Edom's house for those three months. Well then, now... It's going to go back. It's going to come home to Jerusalem. Obed-Edom is instrumental in bringing the presence of God. But you know what Obed-Edom said? Watch this. I'm moving to Jerusalem too. Uh, I, once you've had God in your house, are you hearing me? Once he's been there in your house, you're going to say, you know what? The blessings I have, what God has done for me, there ain't no way I'm going to say goodbye to him. Did you realize that Obed-Edom became the guard of the south gate? He moved where the presence of God went. And oh, what a joy for you and I to say, you know what? My house is God's house. He is welcome in this place. says, I'm, a, I'm in favor of it going back to the holy city. But here's what I'm telling you. I'm going to go with him. Somebody willing to, to walk in changing times. He could have said, you know, look at this place. God has blessed me. You know what? He knew that he could walk in the blessings of God wherever he went. Amen. Give him praise. I want you to stand with me if you will. We're getting ready to pray. What you can say is all is well. When you've given your, you no, know, obviously you don't give your house to God hardly until you've given your heart to God. But when somebody says, you know, Lord, mine is yours, my house is your house, then you can say, like the Shunammite woman, terrible 
atrocities have happened, you say, everything's good. All is well. God's going to work it out. People will look at you and say, you know, people might first of all say, you're crazy. You mean tell me you're going to take your Sunday night or your Saturday night or Monday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever it is? I don't know. But for God to come in, let me tell you something. Last Tuesday night at Merle and Alice's house, we joined hands, I don't know, 12 or so of us. And we began to pray and just had an awesome time in the Spirit. As we prayed, and God just began to give some revelation about people around the room. And we just began to pray the, pray the blessings of God. Not, all, not only the house, but those who dwell in the house and, and, and those in the group. What I'm simply saying is this. There's no telling what's going to come up out of it. Amen? I would love to be able to say, you know what? Maybe they're not going to call me Obed Edom, but say, you know what? He's blessed. He's blessed. And I am blessed. I'm telling you. You, you, you know what? Since we said, God, everything's yours. It's all yours. That's what we do in the church. And you know what God's doing? God's opening the windows of heaven. And God is sending people that ordinarily wouldn't go to church. And they're coming to your homes. And then they show up in church. Those who said, I'll never go to church, came to a life group. They met some friends. Oh, it didn't. It, Normally, it don't happen overnight. I had somebody text me this past week said, Pastor, please give me some advice. I'm trying to deal with a non-believer. You know what? The first thing you can do to scare them away and guarantee they ain't coming is to say, Are you saved? You're about to bust hell wide open. It may be true. But the chance of you winning them has just dropped tremendously by the way you approached it. But if you would do just like Jesus... Say, I know that they're tax collectors, and I know that they're wine bibbers, and I know that they're drunks, and I know that they're publicans, but they are made in the image of God, and God sent me to reach them. Those who are whole don't need a physician. But those people that are hurting, pregnant out of wedlock, struggling on drugs and alcohol and disease, and give their body to the needle and to prostitution and whatever else, God says, I come for. And I want you to be the one to reach out to them, touch them, bring them. They may come to your house before they'll come to this house. But let me say this. If my house is God's house, amen, I'm going to tell you something. They can come in my house and get a smidge of what it's going to be like when they come in here. So here's the question. My head's bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you this. And uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I do want you to respond. And here's the question. And I want us to respond by walking forward all the way to this altar. Now this does not mean because you walked all the way to this altar that that you're fixing to open up your living room. Although it might, but that's that's a conversation between you and the life group pastor and coaches. But you're saying, I'm willing to get in the conversation anyway to see if it's something that God might want me to do. So if you're here today and you're willing to say God's or my house is God's house. Would you just lift your hand up right now? Would you lift your hand with me? Come on. 